Well, good morning, Calvary. It's so nice to see you all here this morning. Welcome to uh, this Lord's Day, Sunday following the, uh, the annual cup match holiday. And it's nice to see all of you there this morning looking bright and cheerful. Just want to take a few moments just to go over, as we are required to do, announcements re regarding the, um, the COVID-19 responsibilities that we have as a church. I want to remind you that uh, face masks are to be uh, worn throughout the service in accordance with the rules that have been given. And also, we want to make sure that social distancing is applied. Um, you'll notice the pews are set a, a distance uh, accordingly. Families of the same household may sit together. Uh, we need to make sure that there is three feet between you and the next family group. In other words, if your family is here, you can sit in one pew. That's not a problem. But we want to make sure that everything, everyone else is, is, is uh, adequately socially distanced. There's no shaking of hands and hugs. We want to remind you that um, in the restrooms, hand washing with soap and water for 20 seconds and then drying thoroughly is, uh, uh, is required. And we're asking that one person at a time in the restrooms and you'll be directed as to where they are. And there are also there's uh, disposable paper uh, required or there for your use when, you, when it comes to touching surfaces like flush handles, doorknobs, and so on. Um, at the end of the service, if you'd like to uh, provide your tithes and offerings, the congregation and touch box is on the right on the wall as you leave. You can use the envelopes and deposit your tithes in that box if you don't already do so online. When you exit, when we finish, uh, please follow the ushers and deacons instructions. They will probably uh, have you egress through using a row-by-row -row basis. And uh, this is done so that we can avoid congestion and choke points. And so we'd like to again welcome you to Calvary this morning. And we trust that your time with us this morning will indeed be a blessing as we worship the Lord this morning. Thank you for joining us. Can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you. 
standing for a word of prayer. Father, we can sing that, that song with such joy. You know, we were once separated from you. We were once just guilt filled with sin. You know, we, we, were, we were on a, just a, a horrible path, a, a Christless eternity. That's the path that we were headed on. But thank you for Christ. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the blood that was shed. Thank you, Father, that now we have been redeemed. Thank you that we can call you Father. Thank you that you, you love us. Even when we fail you, you're amazing and you're awesome. And so, Father, today we say thank you. We say we love you because you are worthy of it. Thank you for your grace that you bestow upon us each and every day. Thank you for the opportunity to worship like this. Even though we're not full, we're still the church. Thank you for those that are online and, and they're worshiping at home. But Lord, thank you that we can access you no matter where we are. Thank you that you're always open and available to us. And so Lord, today we ask that you would get the honor and the glory as we worship you. We ask that as your word comes forth today, that it would pierce our hearts and that we would be moved by you. And that our lives, oh God, would be mirrors of who you are. So have your way in our service today. May you get the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Worthy is the Lamb who we seated everyone. Good singing this morning, Calvary, sounding good, sounding good. Uh, normally I don't make an announcement, but I know Pastor Troy probably will, but I just noticed two people who were smiling a lot yesterday who got married in Tide and so it's good to see Megan and Martin. Congratulations, you two. All right, it's good to see you all this morning. All right, all right. Well, at this time, we're just going to introduce a new song to you. Um, it's called Build My Life, and it's taken from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I just want to read that, verse 11. And it says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And this song is all about building our lives on a firm foundation. You know, we sing that song, Jesus, my firm foundation. Well, what better foundation to build your life upon than Christ? And this is a song that just speaks and attests to that. So we're going to sing it uh, through once, and then you can just join us as on the second round. But if you knew it, sing it with us.
Thank you so much. Uh, let's just have a quick prayer. Father, I thank you uh, for that line in that song which says, uh, open up my eyes in wonder. Open up my eyes in wonder. In fact, that is really what we're talking about today. And I pray that this morning you would open up our eyes in wonder of who you are. Help us to see your glory. Help us to wonder and ponder and enjoy that time of thinking and meditating on who Jesus Christ really is. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning again and welcome. And uh, by the way, uh, you know, I want to uh, just say we, we have... Uh, an opportunity, you have an opportunity to uh, sit there without your mask on while I'm preaching, but please, if you have to go to the bathroom or do anything, make sure you put it on to leave and move about, but you, I, it's, it's okay, I, I don't want anybody falling asleep. Uh, dear friends, Paul Washer said that whenever Christianity is attacked, the first place they attack is the deity, the deity of Christ. And I have a question for you and for me and for all of us, and that is, where are your affections? Where are your affections? Uh, let me say it a different way. Have you lost your ability to wonder? Remember when you were kids? You used to go out and lay in the field, look up at the clouds. Am I speaking Greek to some of you? You never did that? It's a shame. You, you didn't. I, I feel you have a terrible childhood. <laughs> um, just being outdoors, enjoying the beauty of nature and enjoying the beauty of the sky. I remember uh, before I was 12 years old, my first flight ever was when I was 12 years old. I took a flight and went on a plane. And I used to sit down in the, lay down in the fields and look up at the sky and look at those clouds and think to myself, oh, they must be incredible. I can't wait. One day I can reach out and touch them. It's like, um, uh, what's the, 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 the cotton candy. You know, I just want to grab a cloud. You know, didn't you feel that? Especially the big fluffy ones. That never happened to you? Oh, man. And, you know, the wonder of that, the majesty and the glory, and I would think, wow, this is fantastic. And then I flew in a plane, and I'm actually driving through the clouds, and I'm thinking, oh, the plane's not being, I mean, I was just flabbergasted. I mean, not the fact that I wasn't paying attention in school and they told us what the clouds were, and I should have had that imagination, but I clearly wasn't paying attention. Jonathan Edwards used to spend a lot of time outdoors. He would spend a lot of time riding his horse and going out, in the world, out into the woods and, and looking and pondering and thinking on God as he was out there. And oftentimes he was found uh, out in the, uh, looking up in the, in the corners of his house at, at spider webs. Can you imagine? We're trying to get rid of him, and he's looking at spider webs going, isn't God amazing? how they create these, these webs and, and how they hold their prey. And then when he learned that the strength of the, of the, of the web was so strong, and stronger than some of our strongest steel. And you can't imagine that. And you go, wow, God created that. A spider can produce webbing as strong as steel. You see, we've lost our ability to wonder. We've lost our ability to blush. So the other day, thinking about what I'm doing, I went outside to, to just sit on the chair and observe. And I'm looking at the ants. And they're everywhere. And what do you normally like to do with ants? <laughs> My father-in-law used to, every, when he was, he was alive, he would, we would come home, he would say, 253! I said, what? He says, I, I, I made a dent, Troy. I killed 253. <laughs> and he would take his little finger and go, <laughs> all day. That's what he would, he'd love to do that. 
262 today. We just want to get rid of ants. But I was looking at the ants, and then I thought of the proverb that says, go to the ant, you sluggard. And I'm thinking, whoa. Do ants ever sleep? Thank you, Jonah. <laughs> I'm sure they do. But have you ever seen an ant sleep? They're busy, scurrying about, making things happen. I think we've lost our ability to wonder. In fact, let me put it to you this way. When was the last time you changed the channel when something sinful came on that you didn't really appreciate? Sin sells, you know that, right? Adultery, murder, intrigue, deception. We sit there and watch it and we don't even blink. And we don't even ponder the fact that we have a God in heaven who, went all, who came to earth as a man and then died on a cross and went all the way back to heaven, carrying victory in his hands, saying, Father, I did it. I won. I defeated sin, death, hell, and the grave, and they can now be saved. We just blush at sin, even the sin in our own lives. You know what we say? It's just my weakness. It's my personality. Last week, we were talking about, and I think the slides are going to go up in just a second, Last week we were talking about um, uh, the, the deity of Christ, and this is part two, and uh, we'll just move on. And here we, we see this slide, and I want us to just pay attention, remember this slide. It's just a picture. It's, it really pales in helping us to understand the reality of what's going on, but above the dark black line is God, right? God exists. You get that idea? God exists. Beneath the black line is space and time and matter, and God is here too. But before space, time, and matter were here, God existed, right? We get that. So he was always here. And, and he, therefore, he is holy other. He is distant from us. He is, he is distinct. He is God. And we never fail to forget that. And in the Godhood, in the, 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 the Godhead, there is the Father, who is God, right? There is the Son, who is God, yes? And there is the Holy Spirit, who is God, right? And all three are God. Yes, one. Three persons, one God. All three deserving of our worship. Okay? We're going to go to the next slide. We're talking, last week we just dealt with that stuff that existed above uh, that. The idea that he is the pre-existing Christ, the eternal Christ, and he expresses the nature of God. Next slide. But this morning I want us to spend some time talking about some other qualities other attributes of God, they're all there, you see them, uh, with respect to uh, Christ, the attributes that Christ displayed. Attributes that Christ displayed that were particularly, fundamentally demonstrated that he is God. For example, and I will go, go through these rather quickly because there's only really one verse at the end of the day that I'm going to anchor on, and we're going to get there at the end of our chat. First of all, he's omnipotent. You know what that means? That means he's all-powerful. Remember in Luke chapter 8 and verse 22, when the storm was going on out there at sea and, the, and the, the disciples were on the boat and they said to Jesus, you know, wake him, wake him, because he, he, does he not care we're going to perish? And they, he's out there and Jesus says, shh, Wouldn't you wish your children just followed you? In the, you, you know, they got out of line, you just went, shh. Jesus just went, hush, and the winds stopped blowing, and the waves calmed down, and the disciples' response was, who is this? Wonder. Wonder. Not only is he omnipotent, that is, he displays his power, he's omniscient, which is he's, he knows everything. Uh, in John chapter 2 and verse 24, uh, he knows what is in man. And, and knowing what is in man, he did not respond to or, or allow himself to be uh, pushed into a box. He knew what was in man. God knows what is in your heart. I like this one in John 1, his omnipresence. You say Jesus being a physical 
um, being right here, but still being omnipresent. Absolutely. John chapter 1 and verse 48 says to Nathaniel, I saw you before under the tree. Now, that was no big deal because Jesus could have been walking by and he saw Nathaniel and saw him over there. And then, then the other disciples went and called him. That was no big deal. But Nathaniel thought it was a big deal because Nathaniel said, who is this? You've got to be God and king. In order to know you saw me way on the other side of town and you're right here? How is that possible? We don't have this, this uh, jump to warp speed thing going on right here. He thought that Jesus was amazing, that he could see him, saw him before he was approached by the other, prop, the other disciples. Not only is he uh, all-powerful and all-knowing and everywhere present, these are attributes of God that are in Jesus. He is immutable. That is, he's unchanging. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8 says he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You've heard that verse before. The same. The word the same, you know what it means? The same. <laughs> it, he doesn't change. God is the same. Jesus is God. Jesus is the same. You see, we lose our capacity to think and ponder on that. Jesus never changes. You know, you, you, you want to go, my wife is always thinking creatively about how to make new meals. Because she, you know why? She often says to us, I'm just tired of eating the same thing. So she's always thinking creatively. But there's something about the same that makes us think nostalgically. It's home. You know, when the girls come home, we're going to make some of the same foods. And they're going to say, oh, it feels like home. There's something about sameness that makes us go, Thank you for being consistent and being secure and being the same. This is who Jesus is. In him, in John 5, verse 26, has inerrant life, inherent life, that life exists in God, that he is in Jesus, and that he is life. I, I happened to be uh, at a movie once. I was, I was one of the Marvel flicks, can't remember, Captain America ones, and I am sure it was in the movie. I'm, I'm sure it was in the movie. But anyway, at one point he jumps over on the boat and he's running down and he's smashing guys and beating them up. And then um, uh, uh, at, the, at the end, um, Nick Fury comes in and, and he's flaring his coat because he had been killed earlier. You know, he had been killed earlier. He comes in and I heard it. I heard it. Can't kill me, ba. I'm sure it was a quote in the movie. <laughs> Can't kill me, ba. Sounds very Bermudian. So therefore, it may not have been a quote in the movie. Uh, somebody said it in the movie. But I mean, Nick Fury comes back to life, right? He, we thought he was dead and he's alive again. But this is not Nick Fury. Jesus is God and you can't kill him. He, in fact, said, I lay down my life and I will raise it up again. Why? Because in him is an errant life. Can't kill him, but. Let's look at the next slide for a second real quick. There are some other acts that Jesus did uh, where he performed demonstrating uh, attributes of God very quickly. Jesus walked on water. Jesus walked on water, Matthew 6, uh, Mark 6. Jesus restores sight to the blind man in John 9. Jesus did that. You tried doing that. I mean, restoring your sight now that I'm older and my... <laughs> And think, uh, there's a necessity for some of these things. Uh, I can't wait to heaven. Sight restored. <laughs> no more blurry lines. It doesn't excite you. I know. You just see, you just look at, we look at stuff like this and we just, ah, yes, it's, it's Jesus. Wonder, wonder. He forgives sins in Matthew 9. Jesus forgives sins. Only God can forgive sins. The reason I forgive you is because God has forgiven me. I can't forgive you unless God has forgiven me. Therefore, only God forgives sins. I have to acknowledge that. I see that as a God thing. 
This is amazing. He raises the dead in Luke 7. Can you imagine being the mother going behind that coffin that's being carried? Walking down the street, mourning. My son is gone, my son is gone. And then all of a sudden, boing! Hey, what's all the, what's all the noise about? I bet the coffin dropped and everybody scattered. Imagine, yeah, I thought that was bad. That was frightening. Imagine being Lazarus in the grave four days. Lazarus comes out. Man, I had the best sleep ever! <laughs> Can you imagine the fear that was going on in people? Think about, think about when Jesus uh, died, was buried, and rose again, and it says, it says there in the end of the, uh, of the gospel that graves were opened and people came walking out of the graves. And, you know, it's darkness over the land. Jesus is on the cross, is dying, and, and, and darkness over the land. And everybody's like, what's going on? What's going on? And then all of a sudden, Aunt Gertrude shows up, who had been dead five years. She stands straight there and she says, hey, guys. Come on, people. Jesus is God, and he raises the dead. As a matter of fact, Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we are all dead in our sin, and he raised you. Whew. See, we, we, that doesn't even excite us anymore. I was dead man walking, and then Jesus came and made me a living man walking. That should blow your socks off, Uncle Leo. You know what I'm saying? That should just make you go. In fact, that's why Paul never got over. That's why Paul was able to serve the Lord and do as he did. He never got over his transformation. He never got over the fact that he was dead and persecuting Christians and then Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and transformed his life, made him alive, and now he's proclaiming Christ to the world. And right up until his death, he's going to, to, to die, he never got over the wonder of his salvation. He made a dead man alive. And Jesus... Not only that, in Colossians 1, he, he creates and sustains all things. Real quickly, I'm just going to run through the next couple of slides very quickly. Uh, I just want you to see these. There are some dangers that exist against the deity of Christ because whenever, whenever um, the, uh, Christianity is attacked, the first place they go to is the head. They try to chop off your understanding and belief of who Jesus is. Now, I put some words up there that mean nothing to many of you. Some of you probably get it, but not any of you. Ebonites, this, uh, uh, Doset, those guys, Arians, <laughs> Apollinarians, uh, and Nostorians. Okay, I'll get, uh, get my Latin friend um, to, sp to speak these words for us. Okay, Angie, you can pronounce them for me. All right, let me just tell you about some of these. Uh, the Ebonites, for example, in the first century, before the church actually, uh, as the church was growing, the Ebonites uh, said basically that Jesus was essentially a devout man, a devout Jewish man. He was completely obedient uh, to the point that Jesus was adopted into the godhood, into godness. He became God. He was rewarded with godness. This is basically works-based salvation because it essentially says that you too, if you just obeyed the commandments and followed the law perfectly without sinning and blowing anything, you too could be rewarded with God-likeness, all right? This is what the ascetics used to do, when, and the monks, when they would go out into the wild and they would sit on poles for days on end and just, because they wanted to set themselves free from the world, and they would uh, go up into the monastery and, and kind of lacerate themselves, sometimes uh, sitting out in, in, in horrible conditions, for days and days on end, because their whole goal and purpose was to be wholly separate. That is completely contrary to what the Word of God teaches. By the way, uh, this idea of ascending into Godhood, Muslims uh, tease Christians because they think we, we worship two gods uh, at this point. They say, you see, you worship multiple gods. Uh, Trinity, God the Father, God the Son. We only have one God, Allah, he's, he's God. And Muhammad is his prophet. 
And I say, well, that, that, you know, that, that's true, but you treat Muhammad like he's a god. No, we don't. He's not a god. Okay, draw a caricature of the prophet. Muhammad. They will come after you tooth and nail. The point is, they have the prophet as an idol, as God too, but they refuse to admit it. We don't worship two gods. We only worship one. Number two, the docetists, they, they are Jesus. Jesus uh, is said that, uh, Je they say Jesus is God and that he only looked like a man. Like he, he was an aberration, he was a spirit. That Jesus really wasn't real. These are early, early belief systems uh, that were there that uh, were, were into or trying to infiltrate the church. Uh, so much so that uh, they were saying he is not human. Now that really, you know, for three years Jesus shows up and he really isn't real. What you see before you were the apostles went ahead and said, uh, him we have touched and handled and seen with our own eyes. You know, what do you mean? If we've touched him and handled him and been with him, he's eaten, we've seen him eat food, spirits don't do that. Um, the third group, the Arians, the third group, the Aaron's, these are, are a group of people that say that uh, he was first created, the first created being by God was Jesus. The first created being by God was Jesus. Sounds like, okay, uh, very similar to the first group, the Ebonites, the first created being in the sense that he, and so therefore, as the first created being, he was given Godness. He, he became God. Well, that is also a false uh, idea. There are, there are at least two or maybe even three groups of people today that still exist that believe this philosophy, and that is the Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses say Jesus is a God, and he, he is like ascended and was rewarded with God. He's the first created being by the Father. Another group, Mormons. Mormons actually believe not only that he was the only created being, a created being, but that he and Lucifer were brothers created by the Father. Mormons believe that. Today, Seventh-day Adventists actually used to believe, right up until around 1880, I think 88 or somewhere in that neighborhood, used to believe the same thing, that Jesus uh, was, was this, this uh, uh, a person that became God, was rewarded with godness. Believe. They changed their doctrine later, in, uh, later on, around the 1888 or so, to, to not be that. But that's what they did believe at one point. Apollinarians, another group, uh, say that Jesus was God who had, uh, who, had a human, uh, who had a human body, but not a human mind. He was not fully human. Like, so, so, so Jesus was God, yeah, yeah. And he had a body but he didn't have a human mind, okay? I don't know how they figured this stuff out, but in their minds, basically what this means is that, that Jesus has this kind of split personality. He is sort of like, you know, Bruce Banner. That every so often, the hug comes out, and you don't know when he's gonna come out and when he's gonna stay in. Is it, is it God, or is it Jesus? The man. Who am I speaking with right now? Hello. And then the Nestorians came along and they said, no, no, it's actually two persons. Uh, the divine son and the divine and the human Jesus. And they live in, in a relationship, in such a relationship that this, this symbi symbiotic relationship, very similar to the Polinarians. And it was like there were, they, they were so close, these two persons, divine divine God and, and, and human, human Jesus, they were so close that it was like they were one. Which essentially means that what Jesus, what they're saying is that Jesus uh, became something different than what he actually was. And we say no, no, no. He was two persons. Uh, uh, one, per, uh, one, uh, one person, Jesus, but two natures. Two natures, those are two different ideas. Um, so the creeds came along, the next slide, the creeds came along and they kind of try to bring clarity to all of this. 
Uh, the Nicene Creed in, chapter, uh, in 325 said that the Son is of the same essence of the Father. They were clearing up all of the Ebonites and the Docetists. They were cleaning up their mess. The Apostles' Creed, which was probably the first creed, but didn't get actually written down until around 390 uh, A.D., uh, was, was also there, which basically was identifying who Jesus was. It was written to clear up the mess that, no, he is fully God and he's fully man. Uh, the uh, Athanasius Creed, uh, he died at around 73, 373, but his creed didn't come out uh, until the 5th century, mostly overseen by the Catholics and the Catholic Church. Uh, a lot of good stuff in the Athanasian Creed, but not something that we hold to necessarily. But nevertheless, they were clearing up that Jesus is God. Jesus is fully God, fully man. And the Council of uh, Chalcedonian Council also did the same in 451. So in the early stages of Christianity, the full out frontal attack was on Jesus is not God. Next slide. The essence, though, of our faith is in the New Testament credo statements of faith that say, no, he is indeed God. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16, where the apostle says, thou art the Christ. These are creeds written in the New Testament. In chapter 22, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Another creed set up. In chapter 28, verse 18, Matthew, he says, uh, 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 all power has been given unto me. Uh, all authority has been given unto me. Uh, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. These are creeds written in the New Testament. Uh, Mark chapter 12, similarly. John chapter 1, we've looked at two or three weeks ago where he talked about Jesus saying, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Again, creeds that were established in the Bible. In fact, verse 14 says, the Word became flesh another creed. A creed is a statement of faith, of belief that this is who he is, okay? Uh, in Romans chapter 10, uh, confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. 1 Corinthians 8 uh, and 6 and, and 1 Corinthians 15, by the way, verse 3, he says um, that the gospel is this, that, that, uh, that uh, he died. Uh, three days later, uh, according to the scriptures, he was buried and then three days later, he rose from the grave. That's the essence of the gospel, creeds. These are things that we believe. You're familiar, very familiar with Philippians chapter 2. Remember when Jesus says that he humbled himself became, uh, lower than the angels and, and even unto to death? That's a credo statement. At the end of verse 11, it says, and we will, um, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's a statement of belief. Uh, Colossians 1 says the same thing, but I want you to turn your Bibles, though, in the next three minutes um, to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. You say, you're finally getting to the Bible? We've been in the Bible the whole time, guys. All right? We've been there the whole time. But I want you to just focus, let your eyeballs roll across uh, one verse, verse 16, which simply says, and I have it there, uh, it, okay, there it is, um, and it says, it says simply this. Are you ready? Let's read together. A great indeed, we confess, is the mystery, underline that word, wonder of godliness. Here it is. He was manifest in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Whoa, stop, you read it too fast. Can I read it again? Great indeed, we confess, this is our creed, is the mystery, mystery. Do you understand this? The mystery of godliness, and then he, the, the, the writer Paul points us right to Jesus and he says, he was manifested in the flesh. God became a man. This is, this is mysterious. Do you understand this? 
He was vindicated by the Spirit from the time of his incarnation where the Holy Spirit came over him, over, his, over Mary, and protected him in the womb, which is kind of interesting because today in many cultures, the womb is really not a womb but a tomb because they're killing babies today like nobody's business. But Jesus was protected by the Holy Spirit, vindicated. His whole life was covered by the Spirit. And the Spirit comes on him when he's at his baptism. His whole life and ministry on earth was overseen by the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit protected him and vindicated him. So that at the end of his life when he dies and he goes up into heaven, the Spirit of God was there the whole time, making sure that Jesus followed through, that it all happened according to plan. Protecting him, vindicating him. He was seen by angels. And Peter, in Peter's uh, writing, Peter says that the angels look on at you and me with mystery. They can't fathom. How could my creator, my creator, become a man to save you? And what are you doing with it? And, he, and the angels are looking at us and they're saying, Jesus, I see who you died for. I'm looking at Troy and he is a reprobate to the highest order. Why did you do this, Jesus? It hasn't affected his life. He should be living differently than what he is. And it says that he proclaimed, he was proclaimed among the nations. Who's the one phrase, the one term, the one word that everybody anywhere knows. You know how I know they know? Because they use him as a curse word every single time. Even though they don't know Jesus, they know how to really get under your skin by cursing him out in the name of Jesus, but not so politely. But Jesus was proclaimed. Notice, he was believed on in the world. You and I are included in this credo statement. We believe. We have believed. You have trusted. You have placed your faith in Jesus. You have been transformed by his amazing grace. You are one of his because you believed him. And then it says that he was taken up in glory. This is the ascension. This is the ascension and this is the exaltation where Jesus is now going back. According to that first slide I showed you, his humiliation, him coming down to earth, his exaltation, him going back up, he's exalted. He's, go, he's back to the throne where he, he was sitting on his throne and he's there. He's been taken up into glory. We just read these creeds so quickly and we don't trust them, we don't depend on them, we don't recognize that God is speaking to our hearts about the wonder of Jesus. So what then? What is all this about? It should produce at least three things in you and me as we think about and study who Jesus is. Instead of just showing up at church and singing songs about God and Jesus, because that's what Christians do. But we worship from our hearts, from our being. We pour out our souls, which is why it's so hard, I know, to sing with a mask on. But even with the mask on, they can cut my tongue out, I will praise him. That's what should be happening to, to us. We should be overwhelmed with, I love you, Lord. You are a mystery to me. I, I wonder who you are. I reflect on you and I think, oh, you're so glorious. Not only that, it should drive us to worship him. Jesus is Lord and, I, and my master and he oversees my life. I should fall on my knees in worship. But the problem with the church is that people in the church are not worshiping Jesus the way he needs to be worshiped, which is why we talked about in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 23 back some weeks ago when we said, oh, the worst verse in the Bible, in my opinion, the hardest verse, not worst, sir, excuse me, most sobering verse in the Bible is when Jesus get, when we get to the end and we get up to the gates and, and, and Jesus says to you and to me, 
Depart from me, I never knew you. All these years I've been, and what? I want to know him, and it matters that I know him, but what matters more is that he knows me. And then I fall down on my face in, in humility and worship and brokenness. And I say, you are God. And that's the third thing. It should lead to repentance. If you leave here believing that you don't have to change, that you're OK, that I got it together, you don't know the God that I know. Because he's dinging my heart all week long, even now, Troy, change. For my glory, change. And if you're sitting here, if you're out there, and you are not being moved by the Spirit of God to recognize his holiness, that Jesus is God and he dwells in you, and you're not awed by that, you don't worship him for that, it's not a problem with Jesus. <laughs> you get me? So at the end of the day, dear friends, What are you going to do with this Jesus? Who is this? Omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, immutable, inherent life. Who is he? Do you know him? Does he know you? Father, I pray that you move in our hearts today and help us to be awed and wonder in worship of our ma your majesty and your highness. And God, spurn us a sense of wonder, spurn us, stir in us a sense of worship, and help us to recognize where we need to repent and be changed and transformed by your grace. In Jesus' name. Why don't we stand as we sing this last song, This I Believe, which actually is taken from the Apostles' Creed. Uh, Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty, through your Holy Spirit conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. Let's sing This I Believe. Thank you.